Hello. In this clip from our Just See webinar, your bar license is trapped in the 20th century, or is it? Multi-jurisdictional rules and proposed changes. Charity Anastasio and Micah Bookdahl give an overview of cases related to multi-jurisdictional practice. If you want to see more Justia videos on law practice and legal marketing, be sure to subscribe to our channel. So uh, this is by no means the only uh, case law or information about these, but these are the ones that have really stuck out to me in my research and over time looking at, at this issue. And, and Micah, we've, we've pulled these together. And it's kind of a combination of case law, of uh, ethics rules and decisions and opinions. So the first case that really uh, s started the the bandwagon, I think, here is a Minnesota case where an attorney from another state, um, out of the kindness of his heart, helping family members with a debt, decided that he would write a couple letters to try and help them resolve this. And he um, got a bar complaint in Minnesota, which is where the company that he was sending it to uh, was. And they said that he was committing the unauthorized practice of law. And it the court agreed with them. And so he got dinged with a suspension for a certain amount of time in that state. And of course, there's reciprocity. So he probably had problems in his own state. And I always feel terrible for that poor gentleman because you think about it, he was only trying to write a couple letters and help somebody. Uh, the next sort of big landmark is an Ohio case where an attorney moved from another state to Ohio to take a job, but was still working on the cases in her previous state. She set up an office, applied for a bar membership through reciprocity, I presume, um, was working on her cases from the previous state only for a little while. And then she got the response that, no, you won't get bar license here. And by the way, you're committing the unauthorized practice of law by working here. And so we're, we're going to bring discipline against you. Uh, she quickly uh, brought that to the court. The court agreed with them. She, they appealed it to the appeals court. The appeals court agreed with them. And then finally, the Supreme Court said, wait, wait, wait. Practicing law isn't just sitting in some location. It is where that actual action, the happenings of things, the impact is she's only doing work in this other state, even though she's sitting in our state. So we shouldn't ding this person for this. So that was not as as easy as you think it would be, right? That, to me, that is uh, surprising that it got through all of those courts um, until it had to get to the Supreme Court. I think one, uh, one thing we one thing we find is you know there you know there there's friendly states and not friendly not friendly states. Uh, I used to call them stick. I sometimes call them sticky states. Um, and so you kind of you know across the board you can kind of see. In various jurisdictions, you kind of know where there's going to be problems, and and again, it it, it, it usually ends up being a, you know, it goes back to being a, a compet an issue of competitiveness or people, you know, competing uh, and and having some various turf wars. So, you know, those are a couple of the you know more problematic, um, more, more problematic places. Absolutely, and I always think that a, a little state next to big states with lots of lawyers is one that has a tendency to be defensive. And I do think that they change a little bit over time. Uh, I'm barred in Washington State. I moved to Maryland to take over the management of the Law Office Management Assistance Program at the Maryland State Bar and uh, was uh, absolutely flummoxed by this ethics opinion that I read when I first got there that said, um, if you are working in your kitchen um, on cases for DC, from Maryland and you not are not barred in Maryland, we will get you. Like that's a, essentially what it said. I was horrified and I I called discipline counsel and said, is this true? Is this your framework? And and they said, no, 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 we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't really do that anymore. That was the way it was before, but that's not what we would do now. That still didn't make me feel great, right? And, and, they, and they have been a jurisdiction that is a little bit more strict 
because they're right next to DC. I, I just that little, you know, state next to a big state. Uh, it, 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 you you could you want to be careful. You actually want to be careful about these rules. Is the yeah, we always we always talk. Yeah, we always talk about like New York and and basically it, Connecticut on one side and New Jersey on the other. And so again, that concern about you know all these New York lawyers coming into your space, right? Whether it's in New Jersey or Connecticut. Um, and so you know, basically, a lot of it is sort of a knee jerk reaction to to that concern. Yeah, it's generally not client driven, which is one of the points that the, that April made is that shouldn't clients be able to choose their own lawyer? Uh, so back to some of the you know main marker points here. We have on here Arizona's change of the non lawyer ownership of a law firm. That's really five point four, and that seems unrelated. But you'll kind of notice that these rules are interactive and that that comes up also, I think, is an element when when law firms are or when states are looking at this particular rule and whether or not they're going to accept things. And not all states have been on board, obviously, because Arizona and Washington, D.C. are the only ones that have that non-lawyer ownership permission. Still, month, years later, um, I, I think maybe it's a tougher row to hoe and there's a few ethics opinions that even go against that uh, the utah sandbox is that utah bar actually went a different route where they created a regulatory sandbox is what they call it so companies that have non-lawyer ownership do want to offer legal services whether they have lawyers in there or not register in the sandbox they have to report lots of information uh, it's it's kind of a scientific project almost what's going to happen with it but it it definitely interacts with this and and those two states and those moves i think were really for those of us who want the change optimistic moments where we thought here we go if the ball is rolling it's going to happen and then inertia kicked in much like micah has always said to me nothing's ever going to change and and we got an opinion out of new york and an ethics opinion that said um if you are have if you're uh practicing here and you have non-lawyers in your firm that is still an ethics violation is the essential thrust of that opinion one two three four and then the missouri opinions that came out of 2024 which you found what do those say micah so, you know, so in, in, I don't know why it came up in such rapid succession, but in January, uh, Missouri issued four successive opinions, all of them touching, uh, unauthorized practice law and MJP, uh, one dealing with in-house counsel, another dealing with, um, a virtual law practice. Um, you know, basically all of them, if you go back, if you go and you read them, they all basically say that, you know, that if, if you are breathing in their state, um, and you even think about practicing law in any way, shape, or form that you're violating the ethics rules. Um, and so, you know, it's, you know, again, a lot of these opinions, when I read them, you know, they're, they're non, they're, they're nonsensical. Um, I'm in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be in Missouri, right? Like I'm going to drive my daughter to back to college and I'll be at a residence in for a night or two. And, you know, is it likely that I will open up a laptop and work on a matter? Well, for you know, we're videotaped here, so I'm going to say I'd never do that. Um, but you know, obviously, right? Like you, you know, you're working, and so you know, I'm not there practicing Missouri law. I'm not going to court there. I'm not taking any dollars away from any Missouri lawyers. Um, but they, Missouri is one of those states that has a lot of still, you know, very backwards type um, rules and regulations, and they still continually issue these ethics opinions or these informal opinions. That are that make no sense whatsoever, um, you know. Like so, so I, I sometimes wonder, Charity. You, you know, you look at Arizona, which is what we would call a friendly state, right? And so, you know, I, I have many law firms I've worked with where they've purposely opened up an Arizona office because it's so flexible, because it's so easy. Um, yeah. Why is it that Arizona would see these, you know, what I would consider economic benefits of being a little bit more open, I'm not going to say looser, let's just say open, uh, to other lawyers and other jurisdictions uh, versus a place like Florida, which we consider to be pretty much the counter opposite when it comes to, you know, stay out. Um, 
And, you know, they're both to right. me, they're both like those places where you kind of semi retire to and you vacation at and, uh, you know, but they're, they're polar opposites, you know, the one in a bird vibe. Yeah, exactly. You know, so they're, you know, so what, what makes, you know, why is Florida so different from Arizona? Uh, just in terms of their sort of openness and, you know, again, Arizona is a model, you know, I would think that for you, right, Arizona would be kind of a model of what you'd like to see across the board. I, uh, Yeah. And actually, you look at their 5.5 and it's so clear and you can understand exactly what you need to do. It's sort of delightful to read uh, whenever I, I get an immigration lawyer from, you know, calling from Arizona and saying, can I practice here? I say, absolutely. If you're exclusively doing a federal practice area and you don't hold yourself out as working there, uh, you can. And it's clear as day. And then you look at some of these other states and it's almost as if they've intentionally kept the obscurity or or they even specifically know that they have to permit uh, federal only practice areas because of uh, the uh, Florida v. Sperry case ironically happening in Florida, right? which was a, a Supreme Court case that was decided in favor of the lawyer who was a patent lawyer. And he said, I'm authorized under this federal statute, which has supremacy to be able to practice anywhere. Why can I not practice here in Florida, even though I don't have a bar license here, when the CFR say, if I'm licensed in any state, I can practice this area of law. And he won that case. And, and the states have begrudgingly i think some of them have said okay well fine you can but uh, M- uh missouri your example of of a of a less than friendly state even says well you can if you're doing only federal but you're not authorized to set up a continuous and s- continuous office or or then presumably market so i I don't understand why some states are, maybe it really just comes down to Florida already has over 100,000 bar members and they have people that are much more interested in protecting their interests and Arizona has got too many clients and not enough lawyers. And they say, actually, we really need you here. Maybe it comes down to that. Maybe. So let me, let me add on to this uh, when we're talking about state specific stuff. Um, so Michigan is one of those states that did, you know, modify 5.5 recently. They went and made their changes, uh, took effect in just this past September. Uh, and so they basically said, you know, they kind of loosened up their rule uh, to make it easier for people to practice there. Uh, they said, basically, it's OK to practice there if you don't hold yourself out as having an office, if you don't have an office there. Uh, if you're not providing, you know, sort of state specific legal services there, um, and, uh, and, and you're not offering to provide, uh, legal services in the state. So they said it's basically okay to be physically present in the state. Um, just, you know, don't be practicing Michigan law. Uh, but right. that, that's the kind, that's the kind of change. That's the kind of alteration that a lot of folks are looking to, at least when you're talking about it might not help you with the driver's license aspect of crossing borders and practice. Um, but at least the fact that you can be, you know, you can live there, right. And practice law in another place, right. Like you can be a virtual law practice. Um, you know, you can, you can work out of a hotel room, you can do whatever you want. Um, as long as you're not, you know, pretend making it look like your, you know, your license there. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did enjoy it, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more videos on law practice and legal marketing. See you in our next clip.